on the front porch, an artist at work on the street. I'd always have my old pen tacks around my neck, and little by little at night, I would be penciling these people in from all sorts of photographs laid out on my art table. This is The Front Porch on NHPR. I'm John Walters. John Kendall is an artist and art teacher who grew up in New Hampshire and now lives here again. But in between, he spent many years as a street artist working in San Francisco, New Orleans, and several places in Europe. John creates art of great beauty and complexity from the simplest of tools, a pen, a bottle of ink, and a little water. He may be best known for his depictions of the tall ships, capturing their grace and power, and all those intricate riggings. John has a studio in George's Mills, New Hampshire, and he teaches art in the Henniker School District. He's here to talk about his art and his travels. John, welcome to the front porch. Well, thank you. Nice meeting you. You may be best known for your prints of tall ships. Why do they capture your artistic imagination? To see the tall ships uh, in person is just amazing to me. They're just so beautiful. Uh, they're from another time period. It's when I saw them first in Boston back in 1980, uh, sailing in, I thought, boy, these things are just unbelievable. And I decided on the spot, uh, seeing my first ship sail by me, that that would be my new series. Well, I mean, everyone is impressed by tall ships, or just about everyone, but uh, not in, not everyone picks them up and makes them the focus of their work for so many years as you did. Well, I'm uh, Pisces. I've always been drawn to the sea. I spent years living on a houseboat and up and down with the tide, and I've just always been drawn to being on or near the water. What are tall ships like as a subject? I mean, uh, I would think it would be a real challenge to get all the detail in of the the riggings and the masts and the sails uh, without losing sight of the overall image. There's a lot involved with the rigging, and truthfully, I couldn't tell you the names of all the various pieces of rigging, uh, but I take photographs on location. Yeah, you take these photographs back to your studio, and then you're working with a yes. magnifying glass. It, it sounds yes. like a very um, painstaking and lengthy uh, technique. Well, I'm spending uh, an average of 200 hours and up on original work. Uh, I've got a five-inch magnifying glass with a with a light around it, which I can adjust. And usually, my photographs are blown up to full frame. Uh, they're usually eight by twelve inch. And by looking at them through the uh, magnifying glass, uh, I can get all the detail I need. You use pen and ink, uh, but you have a very individual style, almost a painterly style. Um, how do you describe? Your work? Well, I call the technique that I've uh, started using back in the early 70s uh, sepia pen and ink wash drawings. Uh, as a youngster, I used to love pen and ink, and I look at old work I did uh, at Alvern High in Hudson back in the uh, early 60s, and I, I love the detail. Uh, it was a lot of cross hatching and work with an old style Croquil pen. And I also, at the time, loved watercolor, the uh, wash technique from painting. And, oh, it was in the early 70s, I was getting my master's degree in art at San Francisco State. And I decided to do my master's project at the houseboat community in Sausalito. And all the boats there, the old ferries and river boats, were in the mud flats, and everything had a sepia brown tone about it. <laughs> and I started to draw and paint with the sepia brown ink to capture the feeling of that area. And I loved it so much that I thought, gee, this is, this does what I want. It, it captures drawing and painting in the same work. And you've gotten an, an entire career, an entire body of work out of a handful of tools. You, yes. you, yeah. Before we started the show, you, you put out what you call your entire kit on the tabletop here. There's one pencil, there's one pen, uh, two small brushes, and a bottle of sepia ink. That's it. That's it. I can get everything in a standard size envelope. <laughs> so when I'm traveling, I can get water anywhere. And, you know, I'm not carrying around a big uh, 
case full of uh, oil paints or, or even watercolors. Uh, I've got my one bottle of ink and a backup bottle just in case I spill some. And uh, that's how I work. You were working on tall ships for, for quite a while. Uh, recently, I think you've moved on to other subjects. Uh, what are you working on now? I'm currently working on a series of uh, main coastal schooners and lighthouses in the background. Back to uh, the water again. I'm back on the water again. <laughs> uh, each year for the last, oh, seven or eight years, I uh, go up to Rockland, Maine and, and set up my display in the art tent at the Rockland Lobster Festival. And it's a wonderful show for me because you can look out the side of the tent and see schooners sail by. When you're working on a, on a picture with that much detail in it, what happens if you spill something when you're most of the way through? Or has that ever happened? It happened only one time. I was working on location on Hyde Street on, in San Francisco, and it was my first San Francisco street scene. And I, I was right at the end of the drawing, and it got very windy one day. And I was sitting at, literally in the street uh, looking over my shoulder at cable cars coming down at me. And the wind picked up, caught the board. It hit my head, and when, when the board went back down, I splattered ink directly out of the bottle in, in an area off to the right. But it just happened that it was an area that uh, I was planning on putting some trees in. So I <laughs> very quickly... Uh, did a cleanup. I always had paper towels with me just in case, and I was able to uh, fix it so that I knew what happened. But things like that are a little surprising. John Kendall is on the front porch on NHPR. He's an artist, printmaker, and art teacher from George's Mills, New Hampshire. You often put yourself or other people you know in your prints. Uh, how did that get started? It actually started with the uh, scene. I, it was the first scene I did in San Francisco. Uh, it was a scene called Looking Down Hyde Street. I wanted to do a scene that was typical of San Francisco, and it just seemed the right place to sit. Uh, Alcatraz was in the background. I decided on a rice -a cable car going <laughs> downhill away from me. And uh, as I sat sketching the buildings in... Uh, and filming the particular car I wanted, I could tell by looking over my shoulder the, that the particular rice car I wanted would, was coming down. So I'd wait till it, I could see it through the uh, camera. And it, once it was at a particular spot, I'd, I'd uh, take a photograph. And the people on the back of the car are a combination of those people that were actually on the various, that same car over a period of a day. But I thought it would be real fun to put myself in. And my brother James uh, was living out there with me at the time. I put uh, James looking out the back of the car as well. Um, I did it just uh, as an interesting thing to do, figuring that once it was in print, I could send prints back to my family in New Hampshire. And all I said was, look close at this. And they <laughs> said, darn, if you didn't put you and Jim in. And then, I, then people started to say, oh, where are you going to be next? So at that point, I'm either riding a cable car or I've got my portfolio under my arm, and I'm somewhere in the scene. Just if you look close. I used to call it my uh, Alfred Hitchcock touch. <laughs> and uh, back in the early 70s, people knew Al Alfred Hitchcock. And nowadays, uh, when I mention it to students, they say, oh, don't you mean where's Waldo? And I said, well, yeah, that's what really what I meant. <laughs> so, and Hitchcock used to put himself somewhere yes. in every movie he did. Yes, he did. Your street scenes include a lot of people, and I've been told that you get to know a lot of the people that you put in the scene. Yeah, they're uh, mostly people that I meet while I'm at a particular location. For instance, uh, when I lived in the French Quarter, I lived right on Bourbon Street, right at the corner of Bourbon and St. Peter was probably the busiest corner in the French Quarter. Uh, I had a little artist apartment upstairs in a place called the Garden of Eden. And my landlord was David Eden. So 
In the scene, I've got a well-dressed man looking at the Maison Bourbon as if he were listening to music, and uh, that's David. I've got the owner of the Maison Bourbon. A uh, lot of local characters. Uh, when you stay for, oh, anything from four to six weeks on location, you get to meet a lot of incredible people, and you get to see the routines that are happening. Um, the little black kids that used to tap dance for change outside of the Maison Bourbon and Crazy Shirley's uh, are in my scene. And they had a lookout. And apparently it wasn't illegal to tap dance, but you couldn't accept money for that. So they had these little clip-on taps on their sneakers. And I got to watch this unfold. Uh, when the lookout saw the police walking down Bourbon Street, they'd give a whistle, and the kids would just whip these taps off their feet, disappear into the, into the crowd with their change, and, you know, as soon as the police passed through, they'd be right back out doing it. <laughs> and it, it was just something I wanted to capture in pen and ink. So you kind of, in your body of work over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, you've kind of got a visual autobiography almost. Yes, in a way. It's where I was at a particular time. I'd always have my old pen tacks around my neck, and I'd get a sense of who the characters were that frequent a particular location. Uh, I would be working on the buildings on location. I love perspective, and it was a big study in perspective. And little by little, I'd film people over a period of, let's say, five or six weeks that would frequent the, the location that I was at. And little by little at night, I would be penciling these people in from all sorts of photographs laid out on my art table. Uh, who would look good where and who, to, who would be in the front and looking over whose shoulder. And uh, for me, it was a great way to capture likenesses. In fact, at one point towards the end of the drawing uh, called Jazz Preserved Here uh, at Bourbon and St. Peter, I asked my brother James to take a photograph of me when I got to a particular spot and I was carrying the original drawing. And I thought, well, that was a, a fun way to do that, put the drawing of the drawing in. <laughs> and you grew up in New Hampshire. You went to UNH, uh, started as an art teacher in Sunapee, New London. Uh, and then you went out west in the late 60s to go to grad school, uh, wound up spending about 30 years kind of traveling around, or at least a long time traveling around. Um, was that the plan all along? or The plan sort of unfolded uh, as it unfolded. There mm -hmm. was no master plan. Uh, I had taught art uh, in both Sunapee and New London, uh, 1967, 68, 69, first through 12th grade. Every Tuesday, uh, Thursday, I was in Sunapee, and every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was in New London. And uh, when they built Kearsarge Regional High School, uh, which opened in 1970, because I had been in the system for uh, three years in the SAU, I was offered the art position. And it would have been comfortable to say, oh, sure, I'll take this job. But I was starting to get itchy feet and felt that there was, I had some other calling. I uh, felt that I really needed to see if I could prove myself as an artist. And I uh, had heard that if I went out to the West Coast and claimed residency in the, in the state of California, I could go for not much. Well, as it was, I got a job in, a, oh, it was a big chain store called Whitefront, which went out of business years ago kept track of my receipts and was able to prove that I had, had, in fact, lived there for a year. And I got my master's degree at San Francisco State College for uh, $75 a semester. I went for a year and a half, so my master's degree cost me $225. <laughs> when you were out on the West Coast, you were living in Sausalito for several years, uh, which now is a trendy, upscale suburb of San Francisco. Back then, it was very different. What was it like when you lived there? To me, it was like uh, entering an abandoned movie set. <laughs> um, I had made some trips in the area to think about where did I want to do a master's project. And it happened that I uh, had made a couple of trips to Sausalito, 
and was uh, at the houseboat community. I had gone, walked through the old San Rafael Ferry, which uh, Bob Dylan had spent some time on back in the uh, mid-60s. And I saw this fellow sitting on an overturned boat. He was wearing a captain's hat. And I started to ramble on about, oh, I was John Kendall, and I was getting a master's degree in art uh, at San Francisco State, and uh, just sort of rambling. And I said, oh, this is such an area. I'd like to do drawings and paintings here. And this guy looked up. He looked sort of familiar. And he says, well, yeah, well, so who gives a damn? And it was <laughs> Shel Silverstein. <laughs> and I... He was said, the, uh, the he said, songwriter you... and artist and yes. children's book author. Right, and his boat was right at the back of uh, of the uh, old San Rafael Ferry. And uh, he said, oh, look, I'm just kidding. He said, look, I think you'd fit in down here. He said, I know some other artists. I, I know some filmmakers. He said, uh, so anyway, he introduced me around. Uh, I ended up moving on to an abandoned boat with my brother James and an old high school buddy from Alvern, George Gates. And we rebuilt the boat over a period of the summer, and uh, I lived there for six years. John Kendall is on the front porch on NHPR. I'm John Walters. We'll be back after a short break. Still to come, John talks about his long battle with an eye condition and how it's affected his work, and he shares the secrets of being a well-fed street artist. And tomorrow on the front porch, we'll meet a New Hampshire woman who's one of the best bridge players in the world. This is New Hampshire Public Radio. Support for the front porch comes from our contributing listeners and from Country Woods Unfinished Furniture, Route 27 in Raymond, New Hampshire's home for unfinished furniture for over 20 years and a proud supporter of the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forest. And the Marlboro College Graduate Center, Brattleboro, Vermont, offering 11-month master's degrees in management, teaching, and internet engineering. Information at gradcenter.marlboro.edu. Stay with us for more on the front porch. And at 7 o'clock, it's fresh air. This is The Front Porch on NHPR. I'm John Walters with John Kendall, artist and printmaker from George's Mills, New Hampshire, and art teacher in the Henniker School District. John is a New Hampshire native, but he spent many years traveling the world, the U.S., Europe, and following the fleet of tall ships in their travels before winding up living back at home again. I guess you were also in something that we might call an artist's rights movement in in San Francisco back then. Uh, It was illegal to be a street artist, Back in 73, you could not, uh, well, previous to 73, you could not sell work on the street in San Francisco. So a number of artists uh, got together and you needed a certain number, so many thousand uh, signatures to get the proposition on the ballot that would say, uh, in fact, that there could be legally street artists in San Francisco. And... uh, a number of us went out and canvassed the area and got registered voters, and, and it became obvious that San Francisco wanted something like this. So it got on the ballot and passed something like three to one. And uh, the day it became legal to go down and register for uh, your license, uh, I was one of the first in line, and I, I think I had license number 30. That's such a big part of city culture now. Oh, it is. You lived in San Francisco for several years after you got your master's degree. You lived in New Orleans for a few years. You were in Spain and France. Um, how are you making a living all this time? Were you just doing art and selling it on the street? Yes. Yeah. Um, when I was in San Francisco, uh, hundreds of people over the uh, four or five years I was a street artist said, boy, you're really in the detail. If you are serious about detail, you ought to really go to the French Quarter in New Orleans. All those lace balconies, you'd have a field day. (laughs) And after I'd heard this time and again, I decided, well, yeah, I'll do that. So I went and spent a winter there and uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, Started a series of jazz musicians from the annual jazz festival in April. And when I was working on one of my street scenes, I met an American fellow, uh, and his new wife from Barcelona that had lived for 14 years on the island of Ibiza. And uh, we got talking over a period of a few hours and uh, got together and went out and had a meal. And he said, you know, said if you ever want to leave the country, 
I've lived on this little island uh, called Ibiza. It's next to Mallorca. He says, you know, I think you could make a great living there, do, do se- local scenes. And uh, it's frequented by people from all over Europe. And I decided that that sounded like a great idea. So a year later, I just uh, decided I'm headed to Ibiza. I ran the idea by an old buddy of mine. He said, if you'd like to go over on a, on a ship, he said, I know that the Alexander Pushkin is going across the Atlantic. It's going to leave out of Montreal. And the way I used to travel, I'd have a big suitcase full of clothes, and I'd have another suitcase with work that was available. And in this case, it was San Francisco street scenes. And uh, I used to sit out on the back deck by the, uh, by the pool, and I would hand color scenes, and I got to meet all the people that were on the boat. No one was getting off the boat until we docked. And little by little, people invited me to bring my portfolio to, uh, to supper. It was all family-style uh, meals. And uh, I was selling work to English tourists that were going back to England and some Germans. And before I knew it, I had all the, the waiters and cooks coming out from the back room uh, that were uh, the Russians, uh, they were out of Leningrad, and they wanted to get work. And it was just, wow, how great is this? I, I made my expenses uh, to get over to La Havre and got out with, uh, I guess, 150 in my pocket. <laughs> and I thought, now this is the way to travel. I always thought of being a street artist as being a really tough thing to do. I mean, you know, as the guy walking by, I see the vast majority of people taking a quick look, walking by. I would think, you know, there's, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of sort of instant judging of your work. Uh, and, uh, a lot of, I don't know, you got to be kind of strong and you got to be interested in people to do, to sell your work on the street like that. Yeah, it, it was, uh, long hours. I mean, uh, when it became legal the first year, uh, you'd get there early and you'd pretty much stake out your spot. And uh, people would go by all day and you'd have your wares out. I had panels with my local San Francisco scenes hung. I just got to meet an incredible group of people. In fact, the pressman that ran my original uh, scenes from San Francisco was Marty Ballin's dad uh, of Jefferson Airplane. So little by little, I got to meet some of the musicians uh, that were beginning way back then. Somehow, one night, I ended up at a party at uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company were hosting a party, and I ended up there with some of my houseboat buddies. And uh, to this day, I remember uh, picking up a tambourine that was sitting on a, on a piano, and I started to play it, and they were all playing music, and somebody said, well, look, play that, but just be careful, it's Janice's. And it didn't occur to me until later it was Janice Joplin's. And I thought, whoa, this is pretty cool. So after all these experiences and all this traveling around the world, living in lots of different places, uh, what finally brought you back to New Hampshire? Well, I had come back uh, to visit. I saw the tall ships, uh, decided that I do that series. Uh, oh, it was back in probably 1984. I was back visiting and uh, ran into an old friend of my sister's uh, who I ended up uh, a few years later marrying. And uh, when our oldest son, Christopher, was on the way, I thought, well, you know, I've been out traveling for 15 or 16 years, uh, not worrying how much. I made as long as I got from one place to the next. But I thought seriously at that point about, geez, I better get a real job again. So it just happened that uh, Henniker was looking for an art teacher, and they wanted somebody just part-time. And I thought, well, I haven't taught since 69. Here it is, uh, would have been the class of 85, and they were looking for first through 12th grade art teacher. I had my master's degree behind me at that point. I had three years' experience, and I thought, well, I applied for the job and got it. And uh, I'm still there. It's my 20th year. You have an eye condition that affects your vision. Uh, Could you tell us what it is and and how it affects you? 
Um, I have a problem called keratoconus. Um, back when I was living on the island of Ibiza, uh, little by little, my eyesight got worse and worse. Uh, I never wore glasses until I was, oh, 25 or 6. And even with the glasses, it seemed like my vision in my right eye was slowly deteriorating. And uh, for 10 or 12 years, I had to wear a special lens. And at one point, uh, the inside of my lens wore a hole in the cornea, and the only thing I could do was get a corneal transplant. And my body uh, never did accept the cornea. It was from a donor, and it was just one infection after another. So literally, for a couple of years, I really couldn't see much out, out of my right eye. For somebody who does the kind of art you do, that would create uh, tremendous difficulties. It was frustrating. I had the cornea done again in 98, just before Christmas, and uh, lasted about six years, and slowly it deteriorated. Uh, they don't last forever, and you're never sure who was the previous owner or what it went through in its former life. You know, for somebody that loves to do the detail I like to do, uh, at times I just get used to closing the eye that doesn't work, and I work with the one that does. I, do, you, do you worry about this much? I mean, You know, at times I do, but I just look at it like if that's the hand I'm dealt, I'm going to deal with it. Uh, in the event that I can't really see out of one eye, well, I've got one good one. And uh, my favorite thing to, to do ever since I was probably five or six year, years old uh, was to be an artist. And, uh, you know, hopefully the eyesight will come back full strength. But, you know, if not, I'm still going to keep working. You started out in New Hampshire. Uh, you actually taught in the Sunapee area. Yes. Uh, traveled all over the world. Now you're back in the Sunapee area again. <laughs> do you feel like you've uh, come full circle with your life? I do. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, back in 67, 68, 69, I had an art room in uh, in Sunapee at the, at the uh, school, which was 1 through 12. And I found that now I had two boys, and my youngest son, Cody, was uh, re getting registered uh, into the Sunapee system. And uh, I was asked, would I like to go down to Cody's third grade room where uh, he was going to have a teacher, Mr. Kennedy? And we walked down there, and I took one look around and said, I don't believe it. It was my old art room. It was the same room. Now, if somebody had told me in 67, a year out of UNH, that in the year 2000, I would have my own third grader in that very room, I would have thought, you've, you've got to be kidding me. No way. But in fact, it happened, and uh, it, it's so much coming full circle. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, John, thank you very much for coming in today. Well, thank you for having me. John Kendall is an artist and printmaker with a studio in George's Mills, New Hampshire. He also teaches art in the Henniker School District. His website is jakendall.com, and we'll post a link to it on the front porch section of nhpr.org. The Front Porch is produced by Shay Zeller and Liz Bulkley. Next time on The Front Porch, inside the world of Tournament Bridge, Karen McCallum is a four-time world champion, one of the best players around. She's made a living playing a game. She'll tell stories of top-level competition and some of the rich and famous who play bridge. I'm John Walters. Join us on The Front Porch tomorrow at 6.30 on NHPR. This is New Hampshire Public Radio. Coming up to 7 o'clock, it's fresh air at the top of the hour. I'm Roger Parmley at NHPR. We get support from our contributing listeners and from Volvo of Keene. Serving the tri-state area for 20 years, conveniently located on Route 12, just south of Keene, Volvo for life. And McGowan Fine Art presenting Waxworks. Paintings by Ted Arnold, Linda Litchfield, and Joanne Matera. Reception tomorrow evening from 5 to 7. All are welcome. Online at mcgowanfineart.com. You can subscribe to receive the NHPR our news and programs that interest you and your RSS news reader. To find out more, click on the orange XML button at nhpr.org. This is New Hampshire Public Radio, WEBO Concord 89.1.
WEBA Hanover 91.3, WEBN Keene at 90.7, WEBC Gorham 107.1, and WEBJ Jackson 99.5 FM.